First of all, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, good morning, good evening, where, wherever you're calling in from. Um, for anyone that is attending this call for the first time, we have been holding this industry-wide call every month for really any company that wants to participate in the cultivated meat value chain. And the purpose of these calls is really to introduce and welcome new solutions providers into the industry with the end goal that this will establish new collaborations that can accelerate R&D and, and commercialization of cultivated meat. So if your group is interested in presenting on one of these calls, or maybe you're working with a company that could benefit from being on these calls, um, please feel free to put them in touch with me directly. I'm happy to you know, figure out um, when they can present or invite them to the call so that they can attend um, and listen in. So we just have I, just one housekeeping item from my end today, and I just wanted to share that, you know, GFI has been uh, curating this database of cell lines for the past two years, but only recently we've gotten some some good uptake in in terms of like companies that have, um, you know, cell lines available. And we actually had uh, a, a, over a dozen new cell lines get added to our database recently. So if you are looking to acquire cell lines from certain species, um, or maybe you have cell lines that you're hoping to share and that you'd like to be added to our database, um, please feel free to, to browse that link that I just posted in the chat um, or get in touch with me if you have cell lines to share and we can um, get those added. So without further ado, um, for today's speakers, um, please to welcome Daniel Peters from Mara Bio, who's gonna be talking about their unique scaffolding solution for the industry, and also Alan Shee from Dynasite, um, who's going to discuss their low-cost bioreactors and a little bit of how to think about outside the box for scaling bioreactor technology. Um, please feel free to drop questions in the chat throughout, and um, yeah, we'll be able to get to those at the end of each talk. So Daniel, uh, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, to talk to you all today, and thank you all for, for coming to listen. So I'm I'm Dan, and I'm a CEO and co-founder of Marabio. So we're a new uh, spin-out that's just come out of Newcastle University in the UK. We've been going since about February, but we've been working on this technology for a, a lot longer in a sort of academic sense. Um, and really, our technology is this engineered bacterial protein polymer, and what we're looking to try and do is provide an alternative to the bioactive proteins, so things like growth factors, uh, that are out there. And we, we feel it's got some interesting properties that, that might make it uh, of interest to, to people working in this in this sector. So um, there we go. So uh, if you want to grow cells outside of the body, particularly on the industrial scale, you've really got to try and recreate the environment that they would naturally find. So you've got to present them with the right kind of biological cues uh, that they need to have the right sort of growth and behavior. And to do this, you have to supply them with bioactive proteins. And by this, I mean things like um, extracellular matrix proteins that provide adhesion sites for uh, adherent cells, uh, but also growth factors. So things like TGF-beta, FGF2, uh, that really tell interface with the cells and tell them what they, they should or shouldn't be, be doing. But the problem is there's quite a lot of drawbacks to using these factors that have been outlined, I think, throughout various reports that the GFI have published, uh, which I've sort of crop little screenshots here. So firstly, they're incredibly expensive. Um, and you know, a report from earlier in this year shows that a 99% cost reduction may be required for some recombinant proteins compared to what they're currently being produced at. And part of the problem with, with manufacturers actually being able to make these at lower costs, um, so the barriers to lower costs, are really to do with scalable production. So uh, an earlier GFI report from 2001 there shows that um, in a survey, uh, manufacture of these things uh, sort of say things like yield, downstream purification, and scale are some of the biggest challenges they faced when looking at trying to lower costs. The other problem with these proteins is that they're not really very stable or easy to use. Um, for example, FGF2 has a half-life of about eight hours, which means it's really difficult to ship, to store. Um, you know, it goes off very quickly when it's in your media. And when you start looking at larger scales, that becomes more and more of a problem. And in fact, in that same survey, um, sort of in increasing the thermal stability of growth factors was a, an area of big interest amongst uh, cultivated meat manufacturers and also growth factor suppliers. And finally, these factors, they have to be added separately. Um, usually, there's a range of them that need to be added to particular cells. Uh, they can have different properties, they can have different stabilities, and you know, you've got to sort of work out in which ratio you want to add them. So I think there's some problems with what's, what's currently out there, which is you know, um, affecting particularly this sector. 
Now, we've been working on this protein called CAF1, which is a bacterial protein. And I think it's got some quite an, an, quite an interesting set of properties, which uh, I think make it uh, sort of well suited both as a bio material and also for addressing some of these challenges. So firstly, it's really surprisingly highly stable. It's got a melting temperature above 80 degrees. And it, that makes it really easy to work with because you know it's not going to fall apart at room temperature or at 37. So it lasts for a long time. And it's also really easy to use. Um, you can pipette it down onto the surface and it only takes you know, an hour to stick down. And then you can sort of add your cells and get on with your experiment or your production process. It's also inherently bioinert, which is quite unusual. And this really provides us with a, a blank canvas for engineering because it means that we can stick in different bioactive sequences, allowing us to define exactly what signals um, our material will be sending to cells. Um, and there'll be more on that sort of later on. It's also, because CAF1 is quite a simple protein, uh, but it's also very stable, it's very easy to generate new versions of it, which means it's easy to innovate and we can very sort of quickly adapt to things that people might want that we haven't already produced or, you know, sort of changes in the, in the market or the industry. It's also modular, as you'll see on the next few slides. It's a bit like a molecular Lego kit in that you can mix and match different bioactive modules to very easily create multifunctional materials. I mean, you don't have to add everything separately and you've got more of a sort of one pot solution. And finally, we make this protein by bacterial fermentation. So this means that um, we built a production process that uh, we feel should be very scalable. And also we get incredibly high yields, which means that because we only use sort of inexpensive input ingredients, that we feel we can really drive down the costs of, of our mimics. So what is CAF1 then? Um, so it's a bacterial protein and its native function is to be a bit like an invisibility cloak or a cloaking device for bacteria when they're invading a host. So it forms this sort of gel-like coat that surrounds the bacteria. And when macrophages come to try and destroy the bacterial infection, when they try and get a hold of the bacteria, they, they reach the CAF1 coat and they just can't grab onto it. There's nothing for them to stick to. And so the bacteria just sort of escape and go on and proliferate. And if you were to zoom into this coat, what you would see is that it's entirely made of these um, protein polymers that look a bit like a pearl necklace or beads on a string. So uh, each bead is an individual CAF1 subunit. And if you zoom in further, you can see the molecular structure of it. And it's quite a simple sort of 15 kilodalton protein. So it's quite small. It's about six nanometers by two nanometers. But these associate into these very long non-covalent polymers of up to 250 subunits, which are then very flexible. Uh, they can reach microdalton, uh, sorry, micrometers in size and sort of megadaltons in mass. So they're small proteins that can become big uh, as they're assembled and secreted by the bacteria. So this leads me on to the first function of CAF1. So how is it so stable? Well, the reason is, is that it's got what's called an immunoglobulin-like fold or Ig-like fold. And for this to be stable, it has to have seven strands, but CAF1 only has six strands. So the way it becomes stable is that it's actually got an extended end terminus, which contains an extra, what we call a donor strand. And this donor strand inserts into the hole where the missing seventh strand is in another CAF1 subunit, and then sort of binds in there. And in this way, the subunits aren't chemically lim linked, but instead what you have is a stable structure then that's um, you know, very difficult to pull apart. And that's why it has its melting temperature of around sort of 80 degrees. And let's say the upshot of this is it means that you know, you know it's not going to fall apart if it's at 37. Uh, I think we've sort of left it for at least four months and seen no, no problems with it. Uh, and you know, you can, uh, our, our scientists last week uh, left it out for a week at room temperature and it still worked. So it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it is incredibly stable. Um, it's also, there we go. I'd say it's also bioinert. And um, what this means then is that uh, inherently it doesn't really do very much. And you can see that if you put it down on a plastic surface and try to put some adherent cells, these are human mesenchymal stromal cells or MSCs, uh, they try and stick down, but there's just nothing for them to adhere to because the CAF1 is blocking it. And so they just sort of round up and die. But because this is a bacterial protein and we have it sequenced in a plasmid, we can genetically encode bioactive protein motifs, so just a short section of a bioactive protein, into different places in the protein structure. And in this way, we can sort of really define what it's going to do and mimic the activity of these proteins. So just to be clear then, you don't need the full sequence of a growth factor or, or an adhesion factor. You really just need the small bit that interfaces with the cell receptor. And then we genetically encode that into CAF1, and then that has the functionality. So you can see in our fibronectin mimic there, when we've coated the same surface, this time the um, MSCs are able to find um, the bit of fibronectin that we've put in, stick to it through their integrins, and they're quite happy and proliferate really well. 
So it's also quite easy for us because it's such a uh, well-behaved scaffold to be able to generate new versions of this. And um, the way we do it, if you know someone wanted to make us to make something that we hadn't made before, is we first of all have a look in the literature to see uh, what mimics of these. You know, how much can you shrink it down? What's the peptide sequence that has the same bioactivity as the full protein? We then insert that into CAF1 at one of our different places where we know it can really well uh, accommodate mutations. And then we try to produce this on a small scale. And then depending on how that goes, we then produce it in a large sort of 10 liter scale and then go on to test the bioactivity to make sure it still works in the same way as the original protein we're trying to mimic. And this whole process takes, if it all goes well and nothing unexpected happens, it maybe takes about two months. So we can really respond quite quickly um, and sort of adapt to, to new things quite quite quickly compared to maybe some of the other processes. Um, I also mentioned that CAF1 is highly modular, and this really comes down to the fact that it's this non-covalent polymer. And we found out a few years ago that there's um, this really neat uh, way in which we can actually disassemble and reassemble these polymers. And we do this by using heat as a stimulus. So if you heat the CAF1 polymer to above 80 degrees, it falls apart and goes into its individual denatured monomers. But if you then cool this back down to sort of 37 degrees or room temperature and leave it for a bit overnight, um, they refold and actually re-self-assemble back into polymers again. And what this means is that you can take different um, CAF1 polymers that have been functionalized with different bioactivities, take them apart and recombine them to form a multifunctional CAF1 polymer. And the reason this is useful is it means that in a single material, you can combine uh, you know, something adhesive like a vitronectin uh, and then you know, one or several different growth factors all in a single material rather than having to sort of add them, add them separately. And this then adheres to a surface, provides bioactivity to cells without needing to be exchanged uh, every time you change media. So the way we make this, as I say, is by bacterial fermentation. And the general process is that we have plasmids that contain the CAF1 gene, whether it's the unmodified form or the various different um, engineered forms that we've made. We then put this into uh, E. coli bacteria and we grow them in a 10 liter fermenter. Uh, it requires only sort of cheap um, uh, sort of input ingredients, the things you'd usually use to grow bacteria. And we typically get very good yields of this because we've uh, spent a lot of time optimizing this uh, before we spun out. We then have a downstream purification process involving tangential flow filtration, uh, column chromatography, and then that feeds into sort of QC and, and all the rest of the kind of finalization checks. So the main thing is, is that at every stage of this, um, there's bigger versions of the equipment available. Uh, with the fermenters, it's quite easy to actually scale out rather than scale up and just add uh, different vessels on at the 10 liter scale. And in this way, um, we really feel like we'll be able to produce and keep producing sort of scalable amounts of this protein as we as we grow and expand. Um, and we've got a variety of different versions available. So we've got uh, adhesive ones such as vitronectin, laminin, and fibronectin. And then we've also got different growth factor mimics like FGF2, BMP2, TGF beta, and BGF. And so just for the last few slides, uh, I'll just show you some of the data um, that's, that's sort of publicly available uh, that sort of demonstrates how, how CAF1 works. So uh, the first one I'll talk about is our fibronectin mimic, uh, which you've seen a bit of already. Um, but we've grown, we've used this to grow a, a wide variety of cells, both in 2D and 3D systems. And um, this is just a sort of, I think, quite a nice example of how it works, where we've taken um, different concentrations of our CAF1 fibronectin mimic. We're comparing it to uh, sort of commercial fibronectin that we got in. And you can see there that uh, when we've used this to grow adherent MSCs, um, the constant, if we use the same concentration as the um, recommended one for fibronectin, we get at least as good adhesion and proliferation and possibly better uh, when using CAF1 compared to the fibronectin. And again, you can see the difference there between sort of the, um, uh, the two in terms of morphology uh, that is really the same as what you would get with fibronectin, even though it's only a short, a short bit of fibronectin that we've actually put into the CAF. Um, we've also done a lot of work uh, making vitronectin and laminin mimics, and most of this has been on induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. Uh, we've done a lot of work with this with the cell and gene therapy catapult, which are based down in London. And uh, basically, you can see here some of the um, uh, cells that are growing on the CAF1 vitronectin surface compared to recombinant commercial vitronectin, um, and they, you know, they look essentially the same. Uh, they also would seem to be the same in terms of growth characteristics and also their stemness markers and a different and ability to differentiate into different cell types. So uh, we think here we've got some really good um, mimics of, of things that are, are out there already. 
in terms of growth factors, um, this is kind of one of our main uh, sort of focuses now. What we've sort of previously published is some work with the uh, Simon Yaza group in Paris. They had a, um, a hydrogel uh, that they wanted to add some bioactivity to, and they were looking at um, endothelial cells uh, sort of growing throughout this in a process mimicking angiogenesis. And so with this, we used a combination of a CAF1 laminin mimic and a VEGF mimic. And what we saw was that when you added both of them, you could get cells to adhere uh, through the laminin, but also then they began to spread out throughout the hydrogel, um, sort of mimicking the activity of, of the uh, VEGF. We also uh, did another study uh, with Mark Birch's group in Cambridge, uh, which we published a few years ago, where we were looking at a CAF1 BMP2 mimic, as well as a CAF1 osteopontin mimic. And by combining these in the same polymer, we were able to put them down onto a surface. Uh, we used these to grow uh, primary human MSCs. And what we saw was that only in the condition where we had the CAF1 BMP2, you could see changes in gene expression and also patches of mineralization begin to be produced as the cells began to differentiate and sort of go down a bone lineage pathway. And in this way, um, it's important to note that, you know, there's nothing else in the media here. It's a standard media. The bioactivity is coming from the CAF1. And in this way, you can see that by sticking it on the surface in the CAF1 scaffold, we can trigger quite complex bioactivities. So at the moment, our main focus then is on making mimics of TGF beta and FGF2, particularly because we know these are important uh, in the cultivated meat sector. Uh, we've already got these produced and we're just trying to, uh, we're just undergoing testing in, with various different assays. And the data we've got so far looks good. They seem to be active. And it's just a case of sort of showing that more thoroughly. And to do that, we're about to begin testing with the Sun Gene Therapy Catapult again, uh, looking at whether it can replace these growth factors when growing iPSCs. And I just got a little picture here showing you the difference between uh, normal TGF beta on the left and then you know, what we're aiming to mimic it with, with the CAF1, where it's only that small section in orange that we've, we've encoded into the CAF1 subunit. So just to summarize then, what I hope I've shown you is um, with our work that I think we've got, a, you know, an interesting alternative to bioactive proteins that solve some of the problems that these things uh, traditionally have. Uh, it's really easy to use. It's highly stable. Uh, it's free from animal material. We can make very easily multifunctional things that can do multiple jobs at once. Um, we make it in bacterial fermentation so we can really get the cost down. And we believe we've got a scalable production process. And we're really excited to work with this community, which is why it's so great to present here today. So if what I've said is, is interesting to you at all, um, you know, please get in touch. And I've got the email address there. And uh, you know, it'd be great to find out more about your thoughts. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'll take any questions. All right, Daniel. Well, thanks for, for presenting. We can uh, turn it over to Alan now. You want to share your screen? Oh, hello everyone. I'm Alan. Uh, okay. Oh, thanks Daniel for the excellent presentation. We'd love to get in touch too. And thank you, Elliot and uh, Renee for having us. Very excited for this. So uh, I'm from Dynasite and um, I think our presentation today is to give a layout of what we're doing, what we provide, and uh, some uh, experimental discussions to see if we can arrive at a better solution. So the topic of the, the the presentation is, is it true that bigger is better in bioprocessing? <laughs> uh, let me first give an introduction of who we are. So um, I'm surrounded by a very strong team. And um, we the, some, the thing that we all have in common is that we are like really into science fiction. And uh, but at the same time, we have quite a bit of experience in science and engineering itself. So that's that's where we come from. And our flagship product is something called the EGSBY. <laughs> it's a one liter bioreactor. And let me just give an introduction. So all along the side, there's like a bunch of sensors around that vessel and it's like a shell around it. And uh, the purpose of this is to do, you know, behave as a bioreactor and to get as much data as possible, as affordably and conveniently as possible. And to make it automated so that you can be as hands-free as possible. So it includes eight optical density sensors. There's a multi-zone thermal jacket, like a bunch of thermometers, LEDs. There's a very strong magnetic stir that's built in. There's a gas sensors, which is um, CO2 and VOC, which is basically an off-gas monitor, which is integrated in there. and it is able to perform um, 
uh, instructions. But most of the complex instructions are done in the cloud. And then that comes down and then each bioreactor can execute it. So what the entire product ecosystem looks like is like this. There's a, um, on one side, there's something we call the operating system. And then on the other side, there's something in the cloud. And the operating system, Ego S, powers a bunch of different modules that you can plug and play. And you can adapt it to um, your bio application. And we also have accessories such as different kinds of caps and stirs that, and these stirs can directly couple to the internal magne magnetic drivers. So these can um, really adapt the bioreactor to the specific application, whether it be mammalian, uh, microbial, or some synthetic biology thing. And we, we have the software, the orchestration coordination software in the cloud, as well as um, the ability to build kind of like repositories, kind of like code, and to draw on bioprocesses of others or um, public ones as well. <clears throat> so this is what uh, is a photo of a experimental setup in California. So I'm currently in California. The rest of the team is in um, Singapore. Actually, we also have a couple members uh, in 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 the states as well. So you know, it, it, there's a base module here. There's a couple pump modules, some some like a DO module um, and um, a pH module, and then there's a reservoir for sugar and a gas regulator. So some of the modules in detail. This is what we call the pump module. There's there are two pumps per pump module, and um, the mechanism is curvilinear peristaltic. So it's kind of like um, it just bites down on the tube, but the tube remains straight. So it's pretty easy to use. And we have a gas regulator module and you can stack these and daisy chain them. And they include a mass flow meter inside. And then there's like a, a valve that is electronic, electronically controlled. It's pretty simple in terms of the operation, um, <clears throat> but you can control the gases very precisely. And we have, uh, pH module and uh, DO module for measuring dissolved oxygen. And one more is the um, super stir module, which is for certain applications where the magnetic stir is not enough on the bottom. You can add on the stir module from the top and it's very powerful. So <clears throat> in addition to these, we have accessories like different caps, simpler caps or more advanced caps. And then these kind of stirs, which are magnetically driven, have been historically quite popular uh, on our online shop, and uh, they're meant for uh, mammalian culture. And then, like, because the magnetic stir is computer controlled, so you can set programs like make it spin faster, slower, and have a profile or make it reactive based on different sensor inputs. And we also have something interesting like here. Um, which is a rack inside the bottle for mounting things such as scaffolds. And it's integrated with um, some ports that if you were to inject like media, that media can flow over the, the things that you mount in that rack. Uh, so for example, you can, you can envision um, flushing it and then allowing it to aerate and then flushing it again and so forth. So some things that like some examples, um, that we can share are uh, growing immune cells. So this is like a very basic comparison versus the flask. You can keep them alive for, and have them grow very well um, for extended period of time. I think the longest culture, um, it was ongoing for a month or something. And uh, this is an, <clears throat> another company that was using our things to generate organoids. They're, they put in a special stir. So sometimes we also make um, like uh, custom stirs and uh, like that can mate with the magnetic driver inside and then they can do different things. Um, and uh, because we have an off gas monitor and all those different channels, you can use it to detect uh, different smells uh, according to the metabolic processes. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Most of the time you can get a signal out um, like in the combination of CO2 and all those volatile organics, uh, it's usually quite clear. For example, if it's growing or if it's dying or, or, or if nothing's happening, th those are pretty simple to do. And then, you know, if um, you want to do microbial, that's also pretty good um, because in the cloud, you get all those data streams and then you can 
combine them using different logic and then optimize for the growth. So for example, this is one with a uh, yeast that, that grew in, in a matter of uh, hours, I think it was super fast. And <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the data coming out of the um, gas sensor is quite multidimensional. So for example, this is one view of a process, I think in this direction, that's time. And then there are different channels. So if you're able to analyze um, this kind of multidimensional data, there's quite a bit of information uh, information that you can get out. And the way that we sell it right now is um, we have three major packages, which are like around $10,000. And uh, they're basically um, structured around the applications of mammalia, microbial, and symbio with a bunch of different, uh, different composition of modules and accessories. And these are available on our website um, to order. And um, we also enable the expansion from one bioreactor to multiple bioreactors by, um, you know, you can connect them up and then through the cloud, you can orchestrate them all um, so that they work together in harmony, uh, kind of like, um, you know, in, in, in computers, that's what they're doing. So that brings me to the um, um, creative part of the presentation, which is eggs. And <laughs> what can we learn from eggs? Because, uh, and, you know, the, the name has eggs in there. And then, you know, eggs, eggs are a, a good example of bioreactors, right? It's just that we don't, like, we don't make them that, the, the birds are making them. And uh, start with one cell and they grow super fast, like typically double the cell division rate of um, anything in a bioreactor. And the, the densities that are in the cell are super high, like three or four orders of magnitude higher than inside um, uh, like a high-end bioreactor nowadays. So there's so much to learn from there. And, you know, nature evolution went towards eggs of a certain shape, of a certain size, of a certain structure. Um, and it created a lot of meat, a lot of biomass uh, and hedged risk from all these environmental factors. So it's something that we should look at. So if we start from the basics, we look at the structure of an egg and there's a high density media in the middle, the yolk, right? And uh, it's suspended. And if you look at the yolk, it's actually a sm smart structure media. There's like a bunch of different, like high density nutrients or low density areas. And from my understanding, after reading a lot about this, what happens is as the embryo develops, it eats through different parts of the yolk. And that is a way to smartly um, manage the growth of, of that cell mass. And then in addition, it has this very advanced layer, the vitalin, which is smart gas exchange membrane. And that's also the membrane, for example, in, a, in the human egg cell that closes off the egg once a single sperm gets in. So it's a very smart, tunable membrane that I was uh, looking through it. And humanity has, we don't really, we haven't really approached or even attempted to reproduce this. Um, there are other like analogs like hydrogels or something that people have looked into, but to actually make a vitalin or something as advanced as a vitalin has never been attempted, it seems. Um, and that this, I think, is very relatable to what we're doing in a, in a bioreactor. And if we look at the size of the eggs, I think this is something to think about when we consider how to do scale up, because we don't have eggs that are like a thousand liters. And the question is, why not? And uh, if we look at different kinds of eggs, we got hummingbird eggs. Of course, we have also have like insect eggs and other parasite eggs, which are much smaller. Um, but in terms of birds and bird re relatives like dinosaurs, you know, they get pretty big. Um, but now like the, the largest egg that's in existence is 1.5 liters, the ostrich egg. And I think at some point the, there was a dinosaur that had this massive egg, 29 liters large, but that was like the, the biggest egg we've ever seen. And, you know, going through the literature, there's quite a lot of um, uh, analysis on why. So biologically, there are constraints on egg size, uh, surface area to volume ratio gives you oxygen diffusion, the structural integrity of the eggshell and a thicker eggshell usually res restricts the permeation of oxygen as well. So I think that's one of the traditional things that bioreactors don't necessarily 
um, have that limitation anymore. And then there's an energetic cost um, because after that, when you create the egg and then after the egg is bioprocessing, the, the dynamics are quite different. So that's traditionally, and then, I mean, when we consider bioreactors, there's certain limitations that we can borrow, certain limitations that we're, we're free from. And why are some eggs smaller and some eggs larger? Um, there are two kinds of survival strategies, right? There's something called the R strategy and something called the K strategy in nature. R is smaller eggs, but more eggs. K strategy is fewer eggs, but larger eggs. And I think this is really um, something that we can think about or adopt when we create uh, like a bioprocessing plant, right? It's like, do you want more bioreactors and or less or fewer bioreactors? And uh, one is you invest more in each bioreactor when you invest less in each bioreactor. And then you just have to consider the costs of doing either. Um, and, you know, the, the the thing about eggs is they call it parental investment, right? And now humans, as we run these factories, we are the parents of the uh, bioreactors, which are the eggs. So, you know, higher parental investors, fewer, larger, lower parental, numerous and smaller. And the other things are environmental conditions. Smaller eggs are more resilient and larger eggs are more stable traditionally. Um, and they are, enable these um, larger uh, animal sizes. But it's an interesting thing is that the, the other things that consider is the, the larger eggs, the, the nutrient availability is very important because when you get so large, as we all know, the um, uniformity becomes an issue and then it causes when you have non-uniformity in an egg in a bioreactor then it causes developmental issues because parts of it develop at different rates or differently than other parts and i think that's what we're going to look at when we have very large bioreactors it's like you don't necessarily get the desired organism or the group of organisms that you you want out and um finally Last part of this and uh, this very basic analysis is uh, the reproductive strategy. I mean, um, there are some um, animals that develop the eggs in their bodies and some animals that, that develop their eggs outside of their bodies. And if they develop in, in their bodies, they're usually larger, they're usually more protected, they're more protected against the elements, they're more protected against uh, infection. Um, so when we look at scale up, I think that's kind of like being in a clean room or not being in a clean room, you know, whether you're in the parent or not in the parent. And it's expensive to be inside the parent. Um, in terms of the growth characteristics of different eggs, you know, larger eggs, they're slower, smaller eggs, they're faster. Um, and cell dif differentiation rates are also different. You know, larger eggs, they are, they're more complex. The, the things that come out of are extremely complex and small eggs, they're, they're simpler, they're faster. Um, and when we think about it, I think when we're making like meats, we, we, can, we can also grade it along a scale of complexity and then have that related to the size of the egg. Um, now, going back to uh, <laughs> uh, reality is uh, eggs back to bio. So what is this? mean and what might it mean for our company and what might it mean for the entire industry um so what we kind of some uh, i mean this is half informed by us half informed by some of the, the customers so um the idea is to look at large systems as a compilation of smaller systems so like uh, a single bioreactor you can consider as a atomic units of smaller bioreactors. And then if you were to do something like, um, you know, uh, run an amber, you can consider uh, it's it's also a, a form of multiple bioreactors. And then if you extend that idea is if you have a large bioreactor, 50 liters or even larger, can you build, build a data center out of that? And if you had multiple bioreactors, each you consider an egg, they also enable um, new functions. For example, in this kind of topology, you have each each of these squares is a bioreactor. And if you connect them all up, you can do different things at different stages. Some of them are the same, you know, some of them just expand the working volume. Some of them have specific functions like um, injecting gases or uh, doing a, a secondary process. 
Um, and I think just drawing analogies from different industries, going towards this multi-module approach is what um, what a lot of different industries go to. Uh, like, for example, batteries, they're now com comprised of multiple smaller cells. Computers, they're not just one single giant IBM mainframe anymore. It's uh, also comprised of a like a large cluster of computational nodes. So uh, if we do the comparison with the traditional, so this is what we're looking at today. It's it's the, the train of bioreactors, right? And then you go up larger and larger and larger. And, but if you were to stay at some scale, it becomes more um, standardized. And we're looking at something that is basically something like a swarm, that the technical risks end much earlier in this train. And <clears throat> finally, um, this is just uh, like one, one image out of our uh, analysis is if we were to compare the cost um, of building a system at a certain scale, for example, the production leaders going from zero to uh, 10,000 liters, you see all these lines over here, it's reminiscent of those um, like gear ratios in a, in a transmission car as the gear goes up, like you have to transition between different scales of bioreactors and, and you have to match those scales to, to make that train make sense. And if you were able to control the cost and the automation at a certain level, at each bioreactor node level, you can actually have quite a different kind of graph, which kind of grows linearly or it scales with the economies of scale of making that bioreactor. So imagine, you know, like there are consumer electronic devices out there, like computers or video game machines, like Nintendos and so forth. And those are created in the millions per year, right? Um, you can just as well adopt those technologies to make bioreactors. And um, a lot of these cost things actually make sense. Um, I think part of it is it's not really done here. So our call to actions include uh, new customers. We're here to support your application. Um, so you can start very small and you can have a lot of different add-ons and try different things and you can manage it in the cloud. Um, we're also looking for partners to build a sizable bioreactor cluster. Uh, for example, like 50 units, 100 units, 1,000, 10,000, so forth. And we'll, we can work with you closely on that. And for the future development, I think we also want to get the feedback is if we were to make another size bioreactor, how big would it be? Would it be two liters, 10 liters, or something different? So oh, there's no contact here. But yes, um, thank you very much for your attention. That's, uh, that's us, Dynasite. Thank you, Alan. This is fascinating. I, I love it. Um, and some other some other folks in the uh, chat also were were quite interested. Um, yeah, I mean it's reminiscent of I think modular tech in general, like you know solar PV panels. They tend to have much better learning rates as well. So you can imagine the manufacturing of the bioreactor, the cost of manufacturing would go down. These shifts towards like modularity and nuclear reactor design as well. So I think those those concepts can potentially hold um, be valuable in bioprocess as well. All right. Well, I think we're at time. Uh, both of these talks are really fascinating today. So thanks to both the speakers for for coming in. Hopefully that leads to some additional discussions. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll see you all next month. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Great talks.